Good afternoon, everyone, uh, on the sunny uh, Singapore day. Um, my name is Jeff Straussman, and I'm the Vice Dean for Executive Education here at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Uh, so welcome all. Uh, as uh, many of you know, the Dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School is in the United States on a, a book tour, and he's used to making three points. Uh, I, on the other hand, as a former dean, tend to make about 15 points. Uh, but actually, it, it does uh, give me great pleasure um, to introduce the speaker, which I'll do in just a moment. But I, I want to bring the following to your attention. Uh, the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy actually received a gift of a million dollars from Mr. Tay Liam Wee, former CEO and group managing director of Sincere Watch in July 2009. The purpose of the gift is for the school's Center on Asia and Globalization uh, to fund the Hong Xiu Ching Speaker and Seminar Series. Uh, the Speaker and Seminar Series is named in honor of Mr. Tay's late mother. So we're really very privileged first to have that gift and we're equally privileged to have our speaker today. Uh, as many of you know, there's, a, a, th th there's an eight-year-plus um, relationship between the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University uh, and the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. And, and today we have a distinguished professor from uh, the Harvard Kennedy School. And so let me tell you a few things about Professor Zeckhauser. He's the Frank R. Ramsey Professor of Political Economy at the Kennedy School, and he graduated from Harvard College, summa cum laude, and received his PhD there. And of course, he's a professor there, so one might think, other than this visit here, he's never left Cambridge, Massachusetts, but I can assure you that he has. He graduated, uh, uh, I mentioned this, um, uh, he's an elected fellow of the Econometric Society, the Institute of Medicine, National Academy of Sciences, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's won multiple national contract bridge championships. And I said I would say that he's retired um, a forward from the Boston Celtics professional basketball team uh, in Boston. Did, did, I, any, did I convince anybody of that? <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, Professor Zeckhauser serves as senior principal at Equity uh, uh, Resource Investments, a private equity real estate firm. He chairs the Investment Decisions and Behavioral Finance Executive Program at Harvard. Uh, he's a late leading expert on economic behavior under uncertainty, pioneered the field of policy analysis, and is a major contributor to the field of behavioral finance. Um, He's published um, over 270 articles. Uh, he's, his most recent co-authored books are The Patron's Payoff, Conspicuous Commissions in Italian Renaissance Art. Uh, I want you to listen to these titles because you see how eclectic Professor Zeckhauser is. And secondly, second book, Collaborative Governance, Private Roles for Public Goals in Turbulent Times. Uh, Professor Zeckhauser served as the Lee Kuan Yew Distinguished Lecturer in 2008, and in 1982, he co-authored an article in the Quarterly Journal of Economics with the current Prime Minister of Singapore. And I just have to add something that's not on the page. Uh, Kishore Mavabani and I uh, uh, made a reference to that, that the other day, and, and I said to uh, the dean, you know, that's one of the most prestigious, I'm not an economist, but I do know that it's one of the most pre prestigious academic journals in economics. And Kishore said, yeah, and I, had, I couldn't understand it, <laughs> reading the article. So when you see Kishore next Friday, because I know you are, Richard, you have to try to explain that article to him. Okay. So please join me in greeting Professor Zackhauser.
Okay. Um, so I got into the field of behavioral finance about uh, 25 years ago. And you used to get ignored. Um, and people used to worry mostly about how uh, individuals made poor decisions. And there were lots of studies uh, that were done with, um, uh, you know, inexpensive brokerage firms to see that people traded too much, um, in particular that uh, men did worse than women. And it was sort of just, you know, an interesting uh, happenstance. Um, but then people started to worry more about the way markets moved as a whole. And they thought that using behavioral finance, they could do things like explain the equity premium puzzle. They could explain things like um, how you can get panics as the uh, 1997 Asian meltdown. And I would say that the field really took off when um, the financial economy plummeted in 2007 and 2008. And suddenly everybody was very interested because this was no longer, you know, um, Mr. and Mrs. No One from Nowhere were making mistakes. The major financial firms throughout the world had invested um, very poorly. They had risked both their reputations and their survival, and many of them would have collapsed, and many of them did collapse, by investing in assets that um, they didn't understand, and that in case of a, you know, a crash, wouldn't survive. And the interesting thing is um, many people uh, give credit to the uh, U.S. Uh, mortgage-backed security market as being the um, original source of that. But in fact, only $100 billion was lost to that, and somewhere between 10 and $15 trillion was lost to world financial markets. So the question is, what is it that a small group of people on this side of the front of the room make mistakes and that redounds so that everybody in this sophisticated financial world suffers dramatically. I know Singapore didn't suffer as dramatically as the rest of us, but you know I look at it this from um, an American perspective. So um, I'm going to try and convince you that this is an important phenomenon. That basically, you we teach, and I presume it's taught here, how to make rational decisions. You calibrate probabilities. So this afternoon, I was thinking, how likely is it going to be raining during my speech? I have very little experience with you know, Singapore weather this time of the year. But that's a subjective probability. Nobody really knows the answer to that question. And sort of try and make decisions. But I believe that what happened during the financial meltdown was that I didn't know what I was doing, but Jeffrey was doing it. And he's smart. So if Jeffrey's doing it and Kishore's doing it, it must be a smart thing to do. And Kishore is saying if Richard's doing it and Jeffrey is doing it, it's a smart thing to do. And eventually everybody else did it. And they were in a little bit of a rat race because everybody was trying to maintain their profits. And the way to maintain your profits was to increase your risk just um, a little bit. But there are hundreds of thousands of people, probably millions of people, who are involved in financial markets who spend many, many hours every day investigating assets and deciding which ones are good and which ones are bad. And none of them bothered to discover that mortgage-backed securities were a bad investment. By the way, this wasn't so surprising. Banks got um, paid money to originate the mortgages. So after I sold the mortgage to you, I would then I would then take the, I would I would then take that mortgage and or and sell it off to Jeffrey. Jeffrey should know that with that sort of arrangement, I won't be all that careful about how, how uh, secure that particular mortgage might be. So let me give you a few examples. This is, you know, uh, the uh, efficient markets, Obama, the day after the American election. Well, the stock market fell over. Our stock market is about, uh, at that point was uh, 13,000. It fell over 300 points. Obama was very likely to get elected. The odds, I mean, there were lots of, you know, Las Vegas bookies were making odds. Um, there was a man named Nate Silver making odds. The odds that Obama would win were o well over 90%. If this is supposed to be a reasonable thing, if the expectation is zero, that means that if 90%, um, Nate Silver is the person I trust the most, um, that uh, there is no other significant news, 
and the ex election day price should be the expected value of the day after election price. So that means that if Obama was 80% likely to win, that if Romney win, make this a fair thing, consistent with efficient markets, as is taught in every finance course, the Dow would have had to go up 1,200 points. Now that wouldn't have happened. I think that what happened is that people sort of said, oh, Obama wins, that confirms that. Um, economists like to say that you should make your decisions on changes in probabilities, not changes in outcomes. When you have a disease, when you can cut your risk from 10% to 5%, so from 10% to 3%, you've done something more significant than cutting it from 3% to 0%. But most people will pay more to cut it from 3% to 0%. They don't distinguish much between 10% and 3%. So <coughs> here's, I don't, by the way, I'll tell you that I have a cough, and every once in a while during this lecture, you'll, I'll just interrupt myself with a cough, and you'll wait and, and you know, explain why I, what I did in the previous slide didn't make much sense. But there's suddenly, once Obama uh, won the election, suddenly the fiscal cliff came into focus. If you look at the number of stories that were in the New York Times or the Washington Post, those stories uh, for up to the day before the election, those stories were fairly rare, and suddenly that became a big thing. So people were really worried about that. There was also herding in a hint of panic. And suddenly prices are falling. Oh my God, I better get out. And people said, what's going to really happen with the next term? I mean, by the way, Obama has now been elected. The stock market is up you know, since he's been elected, so there really was no, nothing to do that. So let me just mention the founders of this field. Um, Two of them are psychologists, Amos Tversky and Danny Kahneman. Um, and Danny Kahneman, though being a psychologist, actually won the Nobel Prize in economics. And another one is Tom Schelling, who was actually my advisor and my colleague at the Kennedy School. He also won the Nobel Prize in economics. So study this field, you're sure to win the Nobel Prize in economics. Um, and um, this is the way I think of um, beh you know, behavioral economics in general. Um, this is a fat seagull, so I'm wor worried about, I'm sorry, I'm worried about, um, I'll just step over here. Um, this is the price value ratio, the relationship to recent norms. So it doesn't matter what country you're in. When that's very high, you're in a state of euphoria. When that's very low, you're in a state of panic. So in the United States at least, Housing in 2007 was at a completely unsustainable level. And all you had to do was do any sort of calculation, and you would have known that it was an unsustainable level. But everybody sort of said, well, it can only go higher. And in February 2009, the stock market looked really you know, terrible. Everybody was very sad. And of course, that was the time that you should have bought. And let me make the other big point that I want to make here. Um, I presume that many of you have studied statistics. If you study statistics, you're thoroughly familiar with the normal bell-shaped curve. One of the interesting aspects of the bell-shaped curve is far-out observations are exceptionally rare. One of the major findings of behavioral finance and behavioral decision is that far-out outcomes are not unbelievably rare. You know, I had, uh, it's been great for me, I had um, many colleagues who said in 2005 and 2006, the events that we saw in 2007 and 2008 could not occur. It was an impossibility. We had tamed the business cycle. People were moving on to new things. And then it happened. So the extreme outcomes are just much more common than <coughs> people think. If this field focuses on decisions. It, looks at, it makes, tries to make rational decisions where we worry about preferences, probabilities, and then we define the preferences, and they attach to the end states no sort of joy along the way. Many people don't feel this way. Um, let me mention a person who's probably feeling somewhat sorry for himself at the moment, um, who is uh, Mark Zuckerberg, founder of Facebook. Now, 10 years ago, Mark Zuckerberg was you know, a Harvard undergraduate, probably worth you know, $10,000. And uh, now he's one of the richest people in the world. But 
He had a lot of pain along the way this year when his stock came out, or this past year, his uh, stock came out at 38 and it plummeted substantially. So he came here, he got to there, and now he's dropped down to there. 99% of the people in the world, 99.99, was there to say, that's above my highest aspiration. But he's sort of anchoring, I presume I haven't gotten this from him, on where he was, and he sort of said, I had 30, you know, I had you know, $25 billion, and now I only have 16. That's terrible. So if we can find that people make these mistakes on behavior, on financial problems, we should expect that they do much worse on other problems. For example, on whom to marry, on whether to have a uh, medical procedure that has uh, costs and benefits. I, in general, you will see, when you go and you uh, talk to physicians, they will tell you that errors of commission are much more serious than errors of omission. But if something has a 5% chance of saving you and a 2% chance of killing you, that strikes me as a pretty good deal. But that's just not the way people uh, tend to think. In finance, the outcomes all attached to dollar amounts they are easier to think of. It's a sort of a one-dimensional type of thing. Uh, you should value your total portfolio, not your components. One of the things that I tell people to do with regard to investments is make sure to be the boring person at the cocktail party. By which I mean, don't just be interested in buying stocks that you're going to be able to brag to people about how exciting they are. Buy stocks that you can purchase for a low value, low price relative to their value. Okay, subjective probabilities. Um, one of the things that I really encourage people to do is to start thinking about subjective probabilities all the time. Feng Vu, who's sitting in the audience, used to say, take my class. And we would ask every day, what's the likelihood that you know, so many kids will be here by 11.05? Um, what's the likelihood that the dean will uh, give a speech longer than five minutes? What's the likelihood that the Celtics, who, that's our basketball team, having lost four in a row, will lose another one? And you get much better at estimating subjective probabilities. Chersky and Kahneman show that people are terrible about that, and they don't distinguish between 5, 10, 15, 20% probabilities. That's a terrible thing to do. Those, you know, a 20% versus 5%, that's four times as likely. I mean, that's the big game. Frequently, most of the probabilities in life are subjective. If you go to the Sands Casino, you can get objective probabilities. You know, the probability if you roll two dice and you get a seven, one in six, but there are very few places in the world where you get objective probabilities. So if you're going to worry as to whether your collaborator is going to produce an article, whether your partner is going to be able to make a sale when he goes to Malaysia, so on and so forth, that's a subjective probability. Um, so this is a situation, a subjective probability of this. Is, I use the Dow Jones. I should have used the uh, Singapore Straits Times Index. Um, it's up $200. You estimate this. 20% likely to be up 200 or more today implies that you would just as soon win a groovy prize. Um, I have here a blue motorcycle, so I've discovered that um, Singaporeans don't drive motorcycles. But anyhow, we would think of that as a groovy prize, okay? You would just as soon think of that as a groovy prize with that prize as if you, um, a random number from 1 to 100 lies in the interval 17 to 36, which is 20%. That's an objective probability. Okay, update information, gather information and update appropriately, be sensitive to the value of perfect and imperfect information. Now I'm gonna give you a problem and I want, I don't know whether you guys are willing to participate, but you know, I came you know, thousands of miles so I want you to. So, okay, so um, a number of years ago, uh, my mother came to visit us and um, in the middle of the night, she woke us up and said, you have to take us me to the hospital. She said, I have intense abdominal pain. We took her to the hospital and they said, um, uh, we think, Mrs. Zeckhauser, that you have a bladder infection. Take Gantrosin and you'll get better. Three days later, they called us up and they said, your mother's culture didn't develop. That means that she doesn't have a bladder infection. So 
So we're there talking to the surgeon, and I said, well, what's wrong? He said, well, it could be one of two things. It could be a tumor, or it could be appendicitis. But it doesn't really look like either of those, but I'm pretty sure it's one or the other. She said, so what I would like to do is I'd like to keep your mother here for 24 hours, and then we'll know a lot more about what's wrong with your mother. Now, what do you say to the surgeon? Anybody have anything to say to the surgeon? Well, most people sort of say, okay, that's what, that's what we'll do, doctor. But fortunately, I'd been indoctrinated in this stuff for a long period of time, and I said, uh, doctor, it strikes me that if my mother has a tumor, you'll cut her open and take it out if it's operable. He said, yes. I said, it strikes me if my mother has appendicitis, you'll cut her open and take it out. <laughs> so why don't you operate on my mother now and bring both sets of tools. And the surgeon who was in his 50s said, that's really logical. They never taught us that at medical school. Okay. okay, I've now given this example to probably 10 groups of doctors and they never you know, bothered to point out this. So this is the value of additional information. The information is gonna change anything. So don't go and pay something for the information. By the way, my mother had a leaking appendix and she had peritonitis, so, and she was elderly. So if she had waited another day, there would have just been more infection in her abdomen, and it would have been a bad outcome. Okay, real world and world uh, studies. Markets and security prices move often dramatically beyond fundamentals. Okay, so in October 1987, the American stock market dropped 23% in one day. Um, there have been uh, lots of papers that have been written on this, about some obscure decision made in Germany, so on and so forth. Nobody has an explanation for why this happened. Just dropped 23% one a day. Uh, the Nasdaq swoon in the spring of 2000, 2001, it just kept going down like this. If it was really bad for the Nasdaq, it should have jumped down, but it didn't. Um, from 9-11-2001 uh, to Christmas, the stock market rose dramatically. From nine zero, okay, so that's from just before the World Trade Centers were attacked to Christmas, um, the stock market moved up dramatically. What was the great news? Well, one piece of news is that we were going to have to fight um, Al Qaeda for the next decade, at least. Another piece of news is we had an unpopular president. The SARS epidemic has suddenly become known. Um, I mean, there's basically nothing really that was good that could have led to this uh, change in stock market prices. And currents, currencies swing widely unrelated to interest rate differentials um, it, it, or other traditional causative factors. Indeed, if you, I've been looking up the Singapore dollar versus the US dollar. And basically, it's been good for the Singapore dollar, but it does vary an awful lot. And I think you'd have a hard time finding the explanation why you get a three or 4% swing. And there are successful speculators and investors well beyond what you would expect if you're just having you know, monkeys and, you know, typing on typewriters trying to write Shakespeare um, you know, science. Um, and there are big industry capitalizing on this. Um, and by the way, one of the things that's most surprising, I don't know how important mutual funds are in Singapore, but they're extraordinarily important in the United States. We have more mutual funds than stocks in the New York Stock Exchange. Most of them underperform the stock market, and most people stick with their mutual fund year after year after year. Why do they do that? I don't know. They're basically giving 1% to the mutual fund manager. They print very attractive prospectuses, and they give you very good detailed analyses of the economy. But I think that what you really want is you want to know that they're going to be able to pick the right stocks for you. Um, so the whole world was uh, fooled by the subprime crisis, and its uh, contagious effects. So this is, that's, the psychologists will demonstrate, psychologists go around demonstrating systematic biases in individuals' decision making. That's how they make their, their living. And these biases persist despite having significant consequences. And there's a moderate industry identifying regularities in these biases. Let me ask, did they give out the questionnaire? No. Okay, well, there was supposed to be a questionnaire going out to you. Uh, 
Do you have the questionnaire? Will you pass it out, please? Okay, so now what I, I want to do is I want to show you that you fall prey to psychological biases. So I'm going to ask you to estimate three quantities. Uh, no uh, cell phones, no computers, please. Um, and I'm going to ask you to, instead of just giving me your best guess, I want you to give me three numbers. I want you to give me your best guess, which is a number you think it's as likely to be over or under that number. Then your 99th percentile, which is a number it's only 1% likely to be over that number. And then your first percentile, it's only 1% likely to be under that number. So you have to fill in nine numbers. And let me tell you what you're going to do wrong. And um, even though I warn you, we'll do it wrong. But the interesting thing is, once you've done it wrong once, the percentage of people who do it wrong the second time goes down. You should be surprised about 2% of the time. It will be probably 30% of the time. And then it will go from 30% to 15%. So you get a little practice helps an awful lot. So I'll give you a minute to do that. OK, so the first question is, the number of live births in Cambodia per year in 2005 to 2010. That's a no number. So I want you to tell me, how many kids do you think were born in Cambodia per year? Okay, and give me your best guess. And these are not supposed to be things that you know. They give me your 99th percentile. Otherwise, you think I would be really surprised. Only 1% likely it's more than this. And then give me your first percentile. It's only 1% likely there would be fewer than this. The mic is there. I, I'm using this. It seems fine. <clears throat> uh, no collaborating. Okay, so I, I use this exercise because one, I want to demonstrate overconfidence, and two, um, I want you to get into the habit of not just using single numbers but having whole probability distributions on values. So I'd like you now to switch your papers with the person next to you, and I'm going to give you the answer. I'm going to give you the answers, and um, if the answer that the person gave is between their first and 99th percentile, then that's no errors. If it's above their 99th percentile or below their first percentile, that's an error. The true value, it's a little bit like, I asked you to guess how many people would be at this lecture, and uh, you, know, you guessed that there would be you know, uh, 200, and there'd be maybe 150 at the bottom, and you know, do 50 at the top, and there were 70, that would be an error. OK, so the number of kids born per year in Cambodia was 321,000. So just mark it as x for wrong lies outside of the interval, and 0 for right. OK. The length of the Yangtze River is 6,418 kilometers. 6,418 kilometers. Okay. Okay. And the miles of paved, paved road in Singapore is 3,356 kilometers. Okay, so now I'm going to ask you to tell me about your, the person who you're sitting next to, how many, um, how many errors, how many outliers they had. Okay? okay so how many, of the, how many people... Had <coughs> the person next to them had three outliers? No one. One person. Raise your hand. You have to participate. It does you know? It's a hard, hard enough to talk with a cold if you don't. Error. Yes, three errors. How many people had two errors? 
Okay, so that's one, two, three, four, three, six, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Okay, how many had one error? Twelve. Okay, so that's twelve. I mean, what, what kind of thing? twelve? Okay, twelve. Okay, that's uh, seventy. How many people had no errors? So, okay, so we had seventeen with one error, eleven with two errors seven with no errors. Okay, what we should have had is we should have had 2% errors. So basically, the vast majority of you, there should have been two people in the room who had an error. You were overconfident. I warned you you'd be overconfident, okay? Um, and by the way, you knew, you probably knew more about the length of the Yangtze River than you knew about um, the number of births in Cambodia, so you should have had a wider distribution. By the way, if the people who had zero errors put their name on it and gives me the slips at the end, I will give a groovy prize to the person who is the best assessor. I'll have to do it tomorrow because I'm going to have to grade it tonight. Okay, so give it to me afterwards. Okay? But that's only the people who had zero errors. Okay, so um, many of these things, by the way, <coughs> we're now using brain imaging. And by the way, Singapore is trying to do a, a big job in brain imaging. Um, to explain some of these uh, biases. For example, one of the most important biases that people have is that they like to gamble. And we now know that winning at gambling registers in the same place in the brain as getting a dose of heroin. So you can see why we have compulsive gamblers. Okay, this is, I sort of mentioned these things before, this is how the um, S&P 500 ratio is. In January 1st, 2007, it was 27. Okay, so a reasonable number for this is 15. When that number gets over 20, you shouldn't be buying stocks, you should be selling stocks. But when it gets over 20, that means that the stock market has been doing well. Everybody's talking about the fact that I'm such a great investor. And you sort of said, oh, I just sold my assets. They say, dummy. Uh, <laughs> and January 1st, <coughs> 2000, it was 44. That was the height of the internet bubble. There was an article in the uh, Singapore Straits Times yesterday that uh, $1 billion IPOs are becoming more common. Is that an internet bubble? I don't know. We'll know a couple of years from now. Um, so this is, let me just explain the daily changes. I said that we have fat tails. So these are the actual daily changes in the stock market. And this is what a simulated system where you assume normality would produce. Some of you may have heard of long-term capital market where some of the most brilliant people um, in the finance world um, invested in a variety of assets and they assumed that things would behave normally. They didn't behave normally and their $6 billion hedge fund blew up uh, many years ago. Sim okay, so um, economists rely on rational utility maximizing accounts we're hostile to assertions of non-rational behavior, but we have a tradition of empirical investigation. And this has led us to discover a number of anomalies. So currency trading is now more than $1 trillion a day. Now Singapore must love this because you're a center of international finance and trade. And you all know the reason that we have these foreign exchange markets. It's so that you, know, you can buy raw materials from Australia, and you can send out electronic goods to Indonesia. And that's a terrific explanation, but the total amount of currency required to deal with the whole, the world's trade for a year is dealt with in two weeks. So most of the trading of the currency markets are these supposedly smart guys from the Development Bank of Singapore <laughs> trading with these supposedly smart guys from Deutsche Bank. And you should worry, are, are we really that much smarter than they are? And why don't they realize that? So well, that's what happens. Um, so this is what happens, I think I can do, uh, this is the changes between 2001 and 2007. I mentioned this before, this is from right before the financial, right before um, 9-1-1 to 2007. Okay, global warming people hadn't talked about by 2007. It had gotten on to at least our national policy agenda. It probably got onto yours a little bit earlier. Terrorism, the avian flu threat, 
We had the Iraq instability and the Afghan war. We had a subprime crisis, an unpopular president, and a vast level of mysterious derivatives that nobody understood. And you would wonder if you sort of talked to your cousin, who was supposedly a very successful investor, you say, what are you investing in? He said, well, I've got these CMBDO WJs, and you know, the guys at Goldman Sachs put them together for me, and they're really great. And what are they? Well, he said, well, people in California are buying homes, and they get a mortgage, and then things like that. I, I'm not quite sure I understand it. And then I said, how do, am I going to protect myself against the other companies? They said, oh, we're going to insure you with collateralized debt obligations. And collateralized debt obligations is great. I mean, people like to have collateralized debt obligations. Here was a situation that, such that a firm like AIG, which got its start in Asia, um, was insuring people that the other firm wouldn't go bankrupt. But then there's the question as to who will insure the insurer. And when lots of firms went bankrupt at the same time, AIG, in fact, went bankrupt. We bailed them out. We were very nice. OK, I'm going to give you another problem. <coughs> you like the last one so much. <coughs> so I have, uh, this is call, called anchoring. And it's that you stick with your orig original probability too much. OK, your, your original value too much. So I have two bags of marbles here. One of them is reddish, and one of them is blackish. The reddish has nine red marbles and three black marbles. The blackish bag has nine black marbles and three red marbles. So it's purely symmetric. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw marbles out of the bag. I can take one, no, I'm going to put the bags behind my back. I'm going to put one bag down, and I'm going to take this bag, and I'm going to draw marbles with replacement. So if I get a red marble, it's more likely it's the reddish bag. You all understand that. That's some evidence for the reddish bag. So I'm going to show you the draws of the marbles that I got. I got this, and I'll tell you this is true. I got seven reds and four blacks. So it's now more likely that it's the reddish bag. But I'm going to ask you, how likely is it that it's the reddish bag? Now, I don't want you to try and do the calculation. That would, that would, <coughs> that would be too hard. I just want you to think intuitively as to how likely it is to be the reddish bag. So I'm going to ask you, um, I, I'm going to divide the world up into little zones. So I'll start at the top. How many people think it's between 95 and 100 percent to be the reddish bag? All from one bag, all with, I drew the marble out, showed it to you, put it back in, shook it up, took another marble out. So it's not as though Obviously, it's not as though I got seven reds and there are only three in the bag, OK? So nobody thinks it's 95 to 100. How many thinks it's between 90 and 95? OK, two people. How many people think it's between 80 and 90? How many people think it's between 70 and 80? How many people think it's between 60 and 70? And how many think it's between 50 and 60? OK, so I would say your median was about in the 60s, high 60s. Um, in fact, the odds are 96%. Um, so I give credit to the two people who said 95, you know, 90 to 95. But each time you get a red marble, that gives you a lot of information. It's now three times as likely that it's the reddish bag. So the three extra red marbles, that's three times three times three, that's 27. It's 27 to 1. Well, what I'm saying is, I didn't expect you to be the world's fastest probabilistic calculator. What I was trying to convince you was, your intuitive way of approaching this is I started at 50-50, and I gave you information that swamped that information. But you still stuck 50-50. You were sort of anchored. You couldn't move enough to get to a different point. OK, self-absorption. <clears throat> um, Here's a situation where, and I've seen this when I've talked to investment bankers about bidding for companies. I have a jar of pennies. Do you have, do you have pennies in Singapore? No? Well, what? Oh, you have a jar of change, OK? You think that there's $31. And I'm going to pass it around the room. And you look at it, and you guess, and you think it's $31. And what we're going to do is we're going to have an auction in this room. And you are going to write down in the high person wins the jar. And by the way, I'm not going to make you carry home a jar of change. 
I'll give you, you know, uh, bills instead. Okay. And the question is how much you would bid. So, um, how many, so you understand it. If you want to win the, the thing, how many people would bid less than $25? Okay. Okay, $26? 27? 28? 29? 30? 31? 32? People, 30, more than 32? Okay, so now I want to show you what you did. First place, what do you, this is just drawing inferences. This is, you, if you would bid, if everybody bid on your strategy and you bid 31, and you were the high bidder, what does that tell you about all the other people in the room? You bid your best estimate. That tells you that 60 other people in the room had a lower estimate than you do. I don't think that you people think you're the world's greatest change assessors. <laughs> but you tend to rely on your own information. By the way, this is true in business, this isn't true in interviews, so on and so forth. I mean, uh, Dean uh, Strasman has to hire lots of people. He, I, he interviews them, Keyshore interviews them, I'm sure other faculty members interview them. And when they get through with the interviews, we sit around and Jeff says, you know, I thought the guy was really impressive. Keyshore says, yeah, pretty good. And in theory, their interests are perfectly aligned. But at the end, I believe that Jeff will still be more favorably disposed to the guy than Keyshore will. People don't absorb information from others even when they have every incentive to do so. Group decision processes. They exaggerate, exaggerate, exacerbate behavioral uh, propensities. So reinforcing beliefs of why a business deal makes sense and hurting suppresses um, information. Um, so um, the, the implication of this is that when you're participating in a group process, rather than have you know, the executive dean start off and say, well, I think that we should be uh, running this uh, program in Malaysia. I think that he should sit back and sort of say to the most junior person in the room, you know, Professor Smith, what do you think about this? Because Professor Smith, after uh, Professor Strasman says that I think that we should be doing this, is going to be hesitant to do so. And everybody will be providing information supporting the um, decision. So uh, encourage alternative models and contrary evidence and um, major financial houses uh, investing in financial instruments they did not understand. And I believe that they didn't think about them very much. Okay. Laws of version. People reach at the reference points. I told you <coughs> about Mark, Mark Zuckerberg. <coughs> <coughs> Um, if you ask people, we're going to flip a coin, heads you win $100, tells you lose X dollars, how much will you put up? Um, the fair actuarial amount is, um, you know, you, if you, uh, is $100. It's an even bet. Most people will be $30, $40, something like that. Um, because people value losses twice as much the value gains even for small losses. Now these people who are insisting on extraordinarily good odds ratios or extraordinarily good returns for $100 bets are then invested in the stock market where their expected returns are dramatically worse than that. So they're inconsistent between what they do in their financial life and what they do when they answer questions. Um, so this is um, status quo bias which is a subject that um, I developed uh, a number of years ago. And what we did is we gave a number of people an inheritance from their Uncle Joe. And we asked them whether they stuck with their inheritance or whether they switched to something else. And Uncle Joe wasn't trying to tell you what to do. He was just leaving you money, which was very nice. And um, it turns out that the vast majority of people just stuck with whatever Uncle Joe left them because a lot of it is errors of commission versus omission. If Uncle Joe had given me stock in a uh, moderate risk company A and I put it in a high risk company B, I'm gonna feel terrible if it does worse. If he gave me money to put in a high risk company B and did worse with, with moderate risk company A, I'm gonna feel worse the same way. 
Um, here's a very important phenomenon, which I call barn door closing. There's an expression <coughs> that's used in America of closing the barn door after the horse has fled. Otherwise, this is a useless thing to do. So um, I now know that I would have been very well advised to have put a lot of money into Singapore 40 years ago. I didn't do that. It's not obvious that that's what I should do right now. <laughs> but a lot of people do do that. I mean, they, um, so close to mutual funds, to investment sectors, <coughs> to, over <coughs> <coughs> to overseas nations. Um, people do what would have been a good thing to do <coughs> in, the, in, <coughs> excuse me, in the past. Um, okay, so now I want to give you a story from Fortune. Uh, which is a very preeminent uh, business magazine in the United States. And this was an article written in 2000 about a variety of companies that they were recommending for the next 10 years. And they were explaining how these companies were really great, and it was a major article. So I just want to um, show you what they did. This was, here are 10 companies, um, Nokia, Nortel, Enron, Oracle, one, Tom, Viacom, okay, Univision, Schwab, Morgan Stanley, and Genentech. And nine of the ten lost substantial amounts of money. Okay, so this was, you know, Fortune putting its reputation on the line, and nine of the ten lost substantial amounts of money. Now, one of the reasons why there is so much correlation is that they were probably selecting companies that had similar characteristics, which is people usually do. And you should try and diversify your holdings. Okay, um, I have a uh, friend who's a brilliant economist, and I was talking to him recently. He said he gets the opportunity to invest in a lot of startups. He says when he likes a startup, he puts $100,000 into it. And I said, that doesn't make any sense. Of all these companies, um, some of them are much better, much more promising than others. So maybe you should be putting 250,000 into company B and 25,000 into company A, or nothing into company A. So here's an example. <coughs> um, you're managing money for somebody else. You have 50 million to invest in domestic stocks. And you meet 10 managers through Cambridge Associates, which is a firm that was headquartered at my town, but is now operating in Singapore. And they recommend these 10 managers as being terrific, and five of them appeal to you. Now, what they say people overwhelmingly do is they give each of the five managers $10 million. That's not right. Really appeal to you? You know, the number four guy didn't appeal to me that much. Seemed to know something, but didn't appeal that much. The number three guy seemed to be a real live wire. Maybe I should give the number three guy $35 million. Okay, so I'm going to give you one more uh, question just about your... Um, own uh, decision making. Um, I, I presume you people get and answer a large number of emails every day. Okay, does somebody want to uh, volunteer to respond for me? Who raise your hand? If you, no, I, I, yes, I can. Yes, it's too hard to say. Yes, okay, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, how many emails do you answer a day? Three. <laughs> you're a poor subject. I, I apologize. You may be a very wise woman, but you're a poor subject. This most people, I think, respond to many more than three. How many do you respond to? Of the ones you get, yes. So I mean, how many is that? A hundred or a hundred and fifty. Maybe the two of you should get together and figure out <laughs> one of you is doing the wrong thing. Okay. Um, what is the um, most amount of time you'll spend on an email, uh, answering an email during the day? No, I understand. But like yesterday, what was the, long, the most time you spent on any email? Just guess. I mean, I'm not. Ten minutes. Okay. And on most of them, I presume you're spending 30 seconds. Okay, now I believe that responding to emails is precisely the same as investing in these companies or putting money in different money managers' hands. 
Some emails are dramatically more important than others. And it may be that the 10 minute, <coughs> but people don't do it. They tend to balance everything much too smoothly. But I've given this talk at my school, and people said, you know, I've changed my behavior. I now pick out, you know, sort of three or four emails during the day. That's what you do, obviously. And I spend a reasonable amount of time replying to them because they're important. And most of the emails I either don't respond to or I respond to them um, very quickly. So I think I've tried to um, portray that these are a lot of biases and um, they, ap they apply in your personal life and they apply in your financial life. And when they apply in your financial life, it leads to very um, serious types of problems. I think, yeah, okay, so I think I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, um, I'm going to go to the end and just, okay, I had a lot of slides, but let, this, I'll give you this one. This is gaining reassurance without reason. This was the uh, collapse of, during the Great Depression. And you'll notice that in 1930, the stock market moved upwards. And all sorts of people, ranging from the President of the United States to um, captains of industry, said, the worst is behind us. And then the stock market fell another 80%. Okay. So people are much too uh, confident about that. So here's Andrew Mellon. Uh, there, is no, there is no cause to worry. The high, the high uh, tide of prosperity will continue. The, uh, the government's business is in sound condition. And President Hoover, um, while the crash only took place six months ago, I'm convinced we have now passed the worst and will, with continued unity of effort, we shall rapidly recover. There's one certainty of the future of the people, of the resources, intelligence, character of the people of the United States, that is prosperity. Well, you know, we got prosperity when we got into World War II, um, but that was a, a long time and an expensive way to uh, do it. So lessons from behavioral finance. Behavioral considerations matter. They're the best explanation of the housing and security markets of 2007 2008. They were the best explanation of uh, stock price plunge on November 7th. That's the day after President Obama got elected. Uh, they understand, and so if you're in the financial business, you don't, should understand the needs of your clients and improve decisions. Knowledge is the first step. I hope I've um, given you a little bit of knowledge. Reflect on the biases, e.g. overconfidence, and heal thyself by debiasing or rebiasing. And I'll end with a quote of all the ways of defining man, the worst is the one which makes him out to be a rational animal. Okay. So anyhow, I'm happy to um, take questions if anybody wants to make questions or challenge me or anything else. Uh, thanks very much, Professor Zach Hauser. My name is Donald. I'm a uh, uh, assistant dean at the school. Thanks very much for the great lecture. Uh, just on your last point on debiasing and rebiasing, how optimistic are you about our ability? Because a lot of these biases have deep neurological evolutionary basis to them. Uh, Kahneman doesn't think it's much, you know, even after knowing what we do know now, uh, he doesn't think it's uh, very possible that we can rewire and, uh, and restructure our brains. People. Um, I'll give you the analogy to tennis. I've taken a lot of tennis lessons. Um, Maybe I shouldn't take any tennis lessons because the pro always tells me the same thing. For example, get into position, keep you your eye on the ball, put the mic in so uh, you can sit hit down. through the ball, so on and so forth. Your natural tendency is to take your eye off the ball. But after enough lessons, you do learn to put your eye on the ball. And Andre Agassi's father hung a tennis ball over his crib to get him to focus on the ball. Um, I disagree with uh, Danny about this, and I've discussed it with him. Indeed, um, Amos Tversky, who was Kahneman's partner, was a very close friend of mine. And I only met Danny later. Um, Danny is, he's a great Princeton psychologist um, who wrote this wonderful book called Thinking Fast and Slow. Um, and I, the first time I met him, I asked him, Danny, how much would you pay for a 50% chance of winning $100? And he walked around the room, he had heard this question or its equivalent, you know, 500 times. He walked around the room and he came back and he said, $38, that's what I really think. And I said, that's preposterous. And you have a very significant stock portfolio. You know, your stock portfolio is going up by thousands of dollars each day, so on and so forth. And um, 
it doesn't make sense to pay $38. Now, um, I now know, I know, I believe I know the way Tursky and Kahneman wrote their papers, because Amos Tursky was prey to these biases a lot less. So I think what they did is they walked around the world and they sort of watched the way Danny behaved. And then they analyzed it, and Amos was good at analyzing it, and Danny is very smart. Um, I've never proven that, but I think it's the case. But um, I'm also a student of a man named Howard Dreyfus, and he's a very big believer that you can train people in this stuff. And um, I met uh, Howard Dreyfus when I was an undergraduate. He's the father of decision analysis. And um, I went to ask him a question about game theory. He said, no, I want you to read this stuff about decision theory, which I had never read. And I read these philosophical articles which basically said what you should do. And I then became convinced. So I think that I've, you know, I was, it was a little bit like the Catholic Church says, give me a kid to six, um, and then I'll have them for life. And I think that if you can get people fairly early on, and I'm in interested in having decision analysis taught in high schools or even uh, grade schools. I mean, it's so much more important than solid geometry. I mean, you know, I do lots of mathematical things. You know, I spent a year studying solid geometry. Um, I've used it twice in my career. So I would have rather have learned uh, decision analysis. The other thing that uh, Jeff mentioned that I did um, is I play bridge. And Warren Buffett says that bridge is the best preparation for business. And the thing is, you can't play bridge well unless all the time you're assessing probabilities. How likely is it that if I bid, he bid four hearts, if I overcall four spades, that I'll get doubled and go for 800 points, so on and so forth. And after you're making thousands of decisions, and I think you get better at it. And the trouble is that for most people, they, you know, some really important decisions are ones where they only get to make them once or twice in their lifetime. So Jeff just decided he should move from New York to Singapore. That's a really big decision. If he had done that a thousand times, he would have made a really good decision. If he does it one time, you're not, you can't be quite as uh, confident. And that's true with, you know, taking a job, you know, asking a woman to marry you, so on and so forth. You know, the, the really big decisions tend to be uh, the ones that come along once in a uh, long period of time. I mean, including Singapore now has to decide, you know, what population should we target, you know, going forward. That's a really big, tough decision, and I'm sure there will be a lot of emotion and a lot of people who will not analyze it Rationally, now some won't do it for political reasons and some won't do it um, because it's just too hard for them to do so. I mean, I'll give you an example which comes up in affirmative action in the United States, which is that um, you have to give priority to, say, hiring African Americans. When an African American gets hired, there were seven white guys competing for the job. Each one of them says, this is a terrible policy. I would have gotten that job. Well, that's not true. Only one, one guy we get. So what they should say is, this is a terrible policy. I had a one-seventh chance of getting the job. So I think that people can be, and by the way, I don't think you can get rid of all this stuff. That's what, I keep taking tennis lessons, right? Uh, you know, you, you get a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better, and um, it's worthwhile. Hi, uh, my name is Lam Chi Chung, and I manage a private equity fund of funds called Axiom Asia. Um, you know, I, I was one, uh, I, I think all this is very insightful. I think, uh, you know, clearly, uh, you know, I think it does help us understand what's, uh, what's going on. Um, I, I'm just wondering that um, the, you know, sometimes in the, in the midst of actually making an investment decision, there is a lot of noise uh, out there. Um, and uh, with the benefit of hindsight, it's very easy, ah, yeah, you know, this was the behavioral finance mistake that someone made. Um, but, uh, you know, so I, I mean, just take a couple of examples like that. The, the plunge right after Obama was elected. But I think, uh, you know, the, the, there could have been other things, you know, that the market, there's always other things that are going on. Or, or let's take that, uh, that, uh, that time when, during the Great Depression, when it fell another 80%. Um, with hindsight, it's easy to say, you know, there, there was no good reason. But uh, so, so I was thinking that maybe the ultimately the question is whether behavioral finance actually provides a, a useful method of actually <coughs> making better investments. 
And the test of that must ultimately be empirical. And so the question is, have there been behavioral finance, you know, uh, funds that are, operate purely on a behavioral finance basis, and have they made money? And of course, we can't just pick the, the ones that have. We should look at all the behavioral finance funds out there. And has there been a study to show that they have? If you take them all as a group, and there's no kind of a selection of just the winners, uh, that this actually provides us a useful method of making money. Thank you. Well, I think those are very good comments. Um, I think um, in mutual funds is the hardest area, because I think stocks are reasonably <laughs> arbitraged into line. But I think in your world of um, private equity, there are tremendous opportunities and people do dramatically better than others. Um, I suspect you do better than others. I mean, many people start off, well, I don't, let me give you an example of what I, I wanted to do this experiment. Along with a number of colleagues, we frequently invest in um, uh, startup companies or early stage companies. And the typical phenomenon is there'll be eight of us sitting around a table, and some bright young person will come in and say, I have a wonderful idea. They'll go through their whole presentation. At the end, they sort of say, so everybody says, what do you think? Now, my guess is if I did the following experiment, which was um, I'm, going to have, I'm going to act as a stooge because I've been participating, and I'm going to flip a coin before the meeting, and after the meeting, I'm going to just say, this looks very interesting to me. I think I'm going to go in. That's half the time. The other half of the time, I sort of say, well, I think there, you, know, you have some very powerful ideas, but I'm just not certain that the market is ready for them now. So I don't think I'm interested. Now, my guess is that in the first case, my comment would significantly influence my friends who are pretty sophisticated people. So what I would urge people to do, with the eight of us, would be to write down our responses before we hear from anybody. So we get a more independent type of decision. That's what I'm going to talk about tomorrow, is um, the wisdom of crowds. I mean, eight people who are deciding on investment are much smarter than one, and the stupidity of herds. And it's very hard for um, people to overcome this, these herding tendencies. So, um, and I'll give you, I'll, okay, I'm not sure that venture capitalists use this, but I'll tell you some uh, mistakes that venture capitalists make. Um, my daughter worked for one of the two or three best known venture capital firms in the United States. And uh, her job was to work with a partner there and try and put the companies that had done poorly back into functioning condition. So she spent a lot of time with companies which had started off with $50 million in them which now had $8 million left and were losing a you know, million dollars a quarter, trying to fix them. Very hard to do. And it took up the, most of the time of her partner. The firm was so eager to avoid losing on a, an investment uh, that they devoted much too much time to this. And what they should have done is they should have had that same partner who maybe could uh, raise the value of the portfolio by $10 million by doing this work on more promising companies and raise the value by $30 million. Now, I don't know if your company does that, but I wouldn't, I'd be surprised if it didn't. Please? So mine kind of follows on him. My name is Elisa Knox. I actually work for um, Twitter. I'm the only person in Asia outside of Japan at the moment, so I might have... Who do you talk to? Well, I, that's why I write the 150 emails, and they're all 140 characters or less. <laughs> So, um, but it was interesting just what you were saying to him. I, you know, I think so much of what we're doing in the online world is crowdsourcing. So on the one hand, we're getting more information, more data by crowdsourcing. And some things, the bias doesn't matter. So if everybody translates a website into a language, that crowdsourcing, that outsourcing doesn't matter. But there's a lot of things where I think we're looking for a number of opinions. And you could channel this into finance, right? Because a lot of people know things about these startups, for example. So how do you, I don't know, have you thought about balancing the crowdsourcing that's available and the data that's available with the tendency that comes towards bias for large crowds? And then I had a small second question, which is, did all these people who play bridge do it before they became 
what they are now? Like, like, do you think Bridge led to Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, you being where you no, are? Bill, or was Bill this Gates an after? To, Bill Gates learned to play Bridge because Warren Buffett told him he should do it. He'd be a better businessman and a better, you know, director of a foundation. <coughs> yes, I've thought about your question a lot. I'm going to talk about it a little bit tomorrow. Um, if I were to ask a question in this room, there are some people who are very knowledgeable about the answer to that question, some people who are moderately knowledgeable, and some people who have very little knowledge. The, what I'm going to do tomorrow is I'm going to ask people to, um, half the room is going to be raising their hands. It's the usual way we get responses in a crowd. The other half of the people, I'm going to have them answer with clickers, so it's anonymous. And I'm suspecting that we're going to get better answers with clickers. But if I wanted to do it with raising your hands, I would sort of say, OK, we're trying to guess the outcome of this process. The people who volunteer at the, 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 people who volunteer at the outset will get um, $3 if they get it right. The people who volunteer after three minutes will get uh, $2 if they get it right. People who volunteer after uh, three minutes will get $1.50, and so on and so forth. So that would mean that the first people to answer would be the people who knew the most, or at least the people who thought they knew the most. And I think that that's a, um, you know, would be a system that would more or less uh, work out. No, it doesn't matter because it's just your expected prize. So you want to, you don't want to guess at the outset because you don't have any idea. So, you know, you'd rather have, you know, an 80% chance of getting it right, getting $2, rather than a 30% or 50% chance of getting more dollars. So, no, I think that this would work and eventually someone like, uh, you know, Twitter will figure out, you know, something to, the, to deal with this. And um, I'll give you an example on the internet where people are using behavioral decision. Um, are you familiar with Odesk? Okay, so Odesk is a remarkable site <coughs> where you can hire people from all over the world to do jobs for you. But it's, it's more sophisticated than Mechanical Turk. So you can ask people to, my friend who's the leading academic authority of that, he just got his doctorate, um, he uh, asked people to draw pictures of his wife for Valentine's Day. And people, you know, people submitted it and then you, you know, there were five winners, and they each got 50 cents, and then he said, okay, now, it's, you know, you guys, the one who wins it overall will get $10, and they did, a, you know, a pretty good job. He's doing lots of things that's sort of like your response to emails. Um, he's uh, taking the people who are applying for jobs, and most people who apply for jobs uh, hardly personalize it at all, and he's using computer artificial intelligence to personalize the letter. It was just, you know, uh, dear employer, um, I noticed your job which offered so and so and so and so. I have done this, that, and the other thing. And he's just taking things like that. And we think that this will dramatically improve the prospects for people in getting jobs. And of course, ODES makes its money when people get jobs. So they want more people to get jobs and they want to get better fits. So um, I think behavioral decision will be used a lot on the internet. And people make very bad mistakes. I want to tell you, I can't prove that I was responsible for this, but I like to claim I was. Um, when eBay started its reputation system, it had, uh, your reputation was the number of positives minus the number of negatives. So you were just a 343. And the gentleman next to you was, you know, a 321. But he was 322 positives and one negative and you were uh, 400 positives and 57 negatives. And I was at a conference with the guy who's responsible for this system. And I said, this is a preposterous system. People don't click through to see <coughs> the next thing. You should tell people the percentages. And within a month, they started telling people the percentages. So I claim that. I don't know if it's true. But it was just the notion of, you know, eBay was a pretty successful company. Um, incredibly clever idea in my view, um, but they just did something that was very stupid, and that happens all the time. Um, and I think that that's also true vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, venture capital investments and, you know, any other area of life, that people make systematic mistakes and they step back 
they can frequently see that they've made these mistakes. Yes, sir? My name is Peter Yim. I would like to know whether there is a list of major behavioral co considerations that you would consider in the financial markets. Uh, for instance, in the stock market, would you consider that our behavioral response to fear the greed as the uh, major considerations that matter? I think that <coughs> um, what goes on in the stock market is much more complicated than fear and greed. There have been lots of things written for hundreds of years talking about you know, panics and fear, and euphorias and, and fear and greed. But I think lots of things are people uh, wanting to uh, show off to their friends, um, people who are scared of making mistakes. And this notion of, is it fear and greed when you inherit a portfolio from your uncle and you just stick with that portfolio? I wouldn't say it's fear and greed. I would say it's just that you don't bother to think about it. And I want to tell you a story about my advisor, Howard Rafa, a very brilliant man, father of decision analysis. And when it, he started working at Harvard, um, we had to decide how to allocate our uh, retirement portfolio between stocks and bonds, TIA and CREF. Howard went into uh, the administrative offices, and there was the clerk who was in charge. And he said, well, Mr. Rafe, you have to identify how you want to break it up. And he said, well, what do you recommend? Now, you understand, so her job was to collect the forms to make sure they were filled out correctly. She said, oh, I'm not allowed to make recommendations. He said, what do most people do? He said, most people divide things 50-50. If there were three things, they would divide it 33, 33, 33. This wasn't fear and greed. This was just, I want to do what everybody else does. Uh, eight years later, I started teaching with Howard. We gave a class on retirement portfolios. I asked him what he did. He told me the story. He said, what do you do? I said, I put 100% of my money into CREF, the stock fund. He said, OK, I'll do that. And I said, don't you think you should think about it a little bit more? He said, no, no, you think more about these things than I do. Um, so um, fortunately, it worked out well, and we we're very good friends. But uh, you know, that's not fear and greed. That's just um, you know, not paying attention to um, the big moments. And you have to, I mean, it would be wonderful if we had in our office a little alarm bell. And the alarm bell would go off, you know, once every, you know, 55 days. And then we'd say, this is a really big decision. Take your time, think it through, discuss it with friends, and work it out. But we don't. We sort of go along like this, and every decision seems to be roughly um, the same. So uh, unfortunately, we're coming to the end. Uh, as I mentioned, um, next, uh, next Friday, I will actually be at the Harvard Kennedy School. <laughs> so I'll see Richard again then. And, and the dean, uh, our dean, is giving a talk as part of his book launch. So I saw the schedule. And the schedule said, last question, 525. And uh, we're past the time here, so we're more flexible. But every, every good thing comes to an end. And so I'd like to ask you to join me in thanking Professor Zeckhauser for a stimulating presentation. Zeckhauser.